Hey everybody, Ryan Hodgins, Director of Marketing here at Aceloan Robotics, here with Uzi Ibrahim, the Director of DoD. I'm here at the company. Today we're going to be talking about dual use technologies and how to ultimately fast track innovation within the Department of Defense. And so without further ado, um, we'll get into the core, uh, core of the subject here. So Uzi, can you, for the audience here, can you um, define exactly what a dual use technology is in this context? Right. In layman terms, dual use technology is simply uh, commercially innovative technologies that we're adapting to DOD topics and problem sets. So a um, lot of discussion about dual use. Uh, what is dual use? What's not dual use? I think it just boils down to simply taking advantage of the power that the American economy has to innovate products uh, and rapidly adapt those to DoD problem sets, essentially. And so what are some examples of innovative technologies technically categorized as dual use? And then how exactly did those technologies get developed over time um, and then ultimately commercialized? Right. Um, there's kind of the back and forth, right? So one could look at technology that comes into the ecosystem. One could look at technology that came out. So uh, I always like to use the advantage of uh, the example of the internet. Uh, the internet is just a great example of what started out initially as a, you know, a DARPA research project uh, to communicate and connect teams from around the world um, internally to the DOD uh, and to the U.S. government. And then they adapted those technologies to um, what we see today. I mean, like, look at the power of the internet. We're here recording a podcast <laughs> over uh, internet today, you know, people are connecting, uh, trading, doing all sorts of things. Um, so that's an example of innovation coming out of the ecosystem, innovation coming into the ecosystem. I mean, we could just look at the drone industry. Um, you know, we, we have done and created large UAV systems. Um, but uh, most recently, I think we've had a lot of competition with China and creating the small UAS market here in the US. Uh, well, now what you're seeing is you're starting to see um, the U.S. government uh, will give a lot of innovation grants and commercial solution offerings out to the U.S. Um, manufactured drone ecosystem. Um, and they're trying to bring that uh, commercial tech into the DoD space and not necessarily building it within. And so why is this different? What is the traditional innovation process within the DoD look like? Yeah, so I think when people think thought about legacy processes, they, they thought about CIBR, right? So the government or stakeholders within the DOD, they put out a specific topic and not just DOD, but you have DOE and all these different departments as well. They'll put out a specific topic that stakeholders within that branch of government uh, were looking to find solutions for that they technically didn't have all the pieces or a wherewithal or you know understanding or research and R&D in-house. So they, they would put out a listing uh, for a specific topic and have that serve as the means by which industry um, engage and bring you know innovative products to the DoD ecosystem. So uh, I'd say CIBR is a, a pretty good process outside of the old school you know kind of far acquisition process which is like I want to say from what I've heard like a seven year process of testing validation and getting new products into the hands of warfighters or um, you know, end users in DoD. And so in light of that, what recent events um, have made innovation within, within the DoD hyper relevant today? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier before, um, there was a piece about China and China developing really good small UAS products like the DJI um, product. Um, but there was always concerns about, you know, sourcing um, and different uh, means by which someone could take advantage of the, the sensors that are on there to pipe data back to parties who uh, don't necessarily um, have the best intentions for that data. But uh, I think front and center is Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is a great example of um, how we as a community just tend to make assumptions about what the future of war looks like until the first you know fighting happens. And then you start to see people fight, adapt to the battlefield on the ground, and then you start to see them figure out different ways to use technology that wasn't part of their you know, equipment set from that, uh, from that army or from that air force and rapidly adapt that piece of equipment to their fight. 
drones again are front and center. Um, you know, there's commercial uh, offerings and listings um, that uh, were bringing drone technology into uh, Ukraine, um, and they were using it from everything from reconnaissance to uh, payload uh, delivery, as well as targeting. Um, so again, everything is assumptions, uh, as like the great Mike Tyson used to say, everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face. It's similar to that. You know, we, we just have uh, a lot of assumptions we go into a conflict with, we test, we train against, and then when the conflict happens, we rapidly reassess. That's where the commercial uh, market comes in because things that we didn't plan for and account for, uh, the commercial market could be kind of the gap solution for it or provide a solution uh, to that gap. So lots of moving parts ultimately, like major global events as well. Has the traditional innovation process been working um, super effectively as, as you get into the battlefield, as you start to put technologies into action? And what have we seen the, the main differentiators kind of be ultimately in, the, in that space here? Right. I mean, you're starting to see, you know, rapid acquisition processes to our allies uh, over in Eastern Europe. But um, even today, before that conflict, there was a lot of discussion about changing the way that we do business, um, you know, changing the way that we think about innovation as uh, the Department of Defense wide and changing the way that they really uh, foster a good ecosystem for innovation, because ultimately it's not always that specific capability that you're going to lean and fund and wait for. But sometimes it's just about building the capacity within a community to rapidly create a new solution to a new problem. Um, so part of that is reworking the way that we do the business. Um, uh, I think I, the best way that someone put it was uh, I spoke to a member of the DIU and, and they said that their, their role is to wage a happy insurgency within uh, the DOD um, and really change the way that we do business. Because ultimately, like I said, uh, having a, a capacity built within an innov innovation network will be your biggest hedge protection um, when you have global events turn and you don't have solutions that exist today, right? You just tap in the smart minds of the US economy and, and you create a solution that didn't exist before. So um, like I said, a good example of that is Air Force. They've, uh, you know, through AFWorks and through AFVentures, they've really done a lot of great work and just simply taking the processes that already exist, like Cyber or Sitter, and figuring out new ways to use them uh, and really testing and pushing the limits of the acquisition process, which is ultimately the biggest constraint to getting innovation into DoD. Perfect. And with that being said, how, how do you fund and acquire um, as a DoD agency some of these innovative, commercialized, proven, dual-use technologies? What do those vehicles look like? Yeah, uh, you know, there's a number of different vehicles. Uh, you can go more traditional vehicles. Again, like I mentioned, the FAR process, uh, it's just going to take a little longer. You have CRADAs, which essentially serve as research projects. They take these systems, they test them for a bit, and they figure out, you know, what to do with them from there. Um, I think the most innovative ones are the ones that I just mentioned before. Uh, AFWorks uh, and, and AF Ventures have really redone the cyber process to where it's not just waiting uh, me as a small company, I'm not just waiting for a topic that seems relevant to come up. They've created what's called open topics, which allow that small company to take something that they do well and present it to DOD to see where exactly and find end users that could benefit from it, right? So again, we're just taking the best of um, how fast and agile the commercial market moves um, and then applying that uh, innovation process to DOD problems. So you, you no longer have to create from scratch internally, uh, although there's an uh, argument to be said for that, but uh, you are now have, and, and you're, you're 100xing the, the amount of smart minds you can tap into to solve your problem, essentially. And then uh, one other one that I wanted to mention too was uh, the CSO process. Um, I think the CSO is what in the bucket of what we call an OTA, uh, which is an other transaction authority rebranded as a you know a commercial solutions offering, which is a program run by DIU, the Defense Innovation Unit, where they basically take a brand new topic and they put it out there. Not unlike a SIBR, uh, but that topic and the companies that participate 
can you know no longer have to wait for these gates within the server process like phase one transition to phase two transition to phase three uh, but then they can take their research throughout that process and go all the way to hey we're now a program you can acquire within the government so uh, a lot of really cool stuff happening in the DoD space um, you know I'm a veteran myself and it's really cool to see how fast the world is changing on the acquisition side and if you're a small, innovative company looking to do business with it, within the DOD, what advice would you give to that kind of company? Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's not a simple process. Um, there's a lot of different, just blocking and tackling you have to do in terms of registration. Uh, but once you do the blocking and tackling, the biggest advice would simply be to be start reaching out to customers and really start forming partnerships. Um, depending on your solution, you may not have all the answers to the test, but you may have a critical part that uh, another small business uh, would could take advantage of to make a more complete system or product um, that at the end of the day, again, the focus of all of these different things is uh, you know, really impacting the way that warfighters do business uh, to save lives, to reduce costs, to make them more combat effective. Um, so when you think about it from that standpoint, um, what tends to happen is you, you kind of shift your mindset from like, I'm just going to win specifically stuff for my team to how could I partner or build or, you know, attach my solution to some other platform that could really be a value add to that end user. So uh, I like to say there's three, three C's in business. You have cash, you have culture, and then you have customer feedback. I think the customer feedback front um, is hyper critical to designing that product for that specific user and the pathway to get there um, is all obviously going direct to customer but also finding partners that work with the with that customer so my biggest thing is tap the knowledge of people who are already there uh, figure out where you can fit in and start you know plugging into the system perfect and is there is there anything else you'd like to add you know, um, just wanted to say uh, thank you to all of our um, Air Force and Army and all our different DOD contacts we've developed thus far. Um, like I said, back to the three C's, customer engagement from our team has been super important in terms of designing and really adapting our commercial tech to the defense sector. Um, but it helps us identify use cases we never even thought about before. So uh, just really appreciate the engagement that we've had really appreciate the ability for us to engage out to members of VOD. Um, and also, we just thank all the partners that we've developed thus far and, and getting us to where we're at today. So just wanted to ultimately say thanks.